Okay, so welcome back to the Q&A session, wireless transmission. Today I will cover multiplexing, modulation and spreading. So let's start with multiplexing. The basic idea of multiplexing, let's go to the correct slide, uh, the, is that we somehow subdivide the space, time, frequency, code, polarization to allow several channels to use the medium, the space, whatever it is. So I introduced several multiplexing schemes in space, frequency, and there was one, I guess, that was a bit more strange. We had already in telematics something like frequency and time division multiplexing. Time is the normal case for a local area network. But we had the bit more strange case of code division multiplexing. I will go into more details of code division multiplexing when I cover CDMA. That's the multiple access scheme that uses code division multiplexing. So for now, it's enough that you understand, okay, somehow using a special code, later on we'll know these are so-called orthogonal codes. We use a special code. This allows us to separate different channels. And I gave the example of the party that you can use German and Finnish. So these codes, the languages are more or less orthogonal. So they have more or less nothing in common. Uh, so you can have two conversations, one in German, one in Finnish, in the same room, that's the same space, same frequency, that's the audio, the normal voice frequencies at the same time without too much interference as long as no one is too loud. I also covered uh, the idea of cognitive radios, cognitive radios, these are systems that can reuse the so-called white space. That means as part of the spectrum that is for a certain amount of time unused. Maybe because you shut down the analog TV or right now no one has to transmit something. The so-called primary user doesn't have to transmit anything. Okay, and then finally there was this thing about polarization something we use in satellite communication but also in wireless communication systems here on earth we know this also from other fields or oh, this is one of the questions okay so that was basically uh, the idea here okay we'll come to the questions and also uh, the questions you sent via the chat uh, so there is a one question. Ah, so <laughs> that's not the question. There's audio, so it's a bit confusing for me to hear and to write. Let's see, you have to be multiple personalities. Uh, so questions. Okay, there should be audio. Yes, absolutely. Um, one question is. We can use a frequency assigned to a specific sender by authority, yeah, and now it's free. So how can we distinguish an authorized sender from someone like we are? So the point is the so-called primary user, these are the authorized senders, uh, they can also scan the spectrum. And as soon as an authorized user notices that there's someone else on the spectrum, this authorized user can actually complain, go to some authority. So this is, for example, what we also do on campus. So all the hotspots, uh, they can scan the spectrum to detect other wireless LANs. This is basically done to avoid interference, but you can also find out some other hotspots operating there, maybe creating uh, some interference with the hotspots of the university and uh, so this can be done so you can actually check the spectrum and then uh, while listening to the spectrum and then recognize oh there's someone else 
using this spectrum. And so this is one way of reusing the uh, white space. Uh, but you are absolutely right, you cannot just by receiving a signal detect, oh, this is now an illegal use or a legal use. So only the primary users in the end can say, okay, I'm the primary user, but there's someone else. No, I want to have the spectrum. So there's someone illegally using this spectrum. So uh, this, uh, more, yeah, we can also go to this question with the cognitive radios. I will come back to the other questions asked in the chat. Um, this is one way of dealing with the old, the old unused spectrum of analog TV. Uh, do you know what is, for example, done in Germany and other European countries and also other countries around the globe with the old spectrum? Because usually we do not do this cognitive radio thing here, but something different. So what's usually done here is we reassign the spectrum. So for example, the old, even the old digital uh, television spectrum, DVB-T, the older digital standard, the spectrum is now reused for LTE. So the approach in Europe is usually that some regulation authority says, okay, now we phase out the old technology and replace it by another technology. So this is then not a cognitive radio, but more a cognitive authority, something like this. So that's the idea here. Okay, so then there's another question. Why should we stop our uh, da, 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 uh, transmission when we detect someone else started transmission? Okay, why should we stop our... Well, that the point is um, you can transmit on the same frequency if someone else is sending there, but you have an increased interference. So it's usually of no use to continue sending on this frequency uh, because in the end uh, you will have well too many transmission errors. So you cannot re uh, use the signal. So we will come to the medium access technologies in chapter three, how we then actually use the medium. But for now it's enough to know that if two senders send without any other multiplexing technology, send at the same frequency at the same time, you create a lot of interference, so it's uh, useless to continue with your transmission. Well, depending on the setting of where the senders are, where the receivers are. But uh, that's usually the case in this cognitive radio setting that the secondary users have to step back. So as soon as they see, okay, there's someone else, using the medium, I have to step back. The question is what happens if several secondary users create interference? Well, then this is a question of the medium access scheme. So we will learn a bit more about schemes like ALOA, slotted ALOA, etc. These are schemes of uh, medium access and this is how we can control this to avoid too much interference. For now, well, we are dealing with the multiplexing. It's enough to know, okay, we know how to separate the spectrum and we can even reuse spectrum if it's currently unused. So that at least you heard the term cognitive radio. Okay, so that is one of the problems with reusing. And then I had the question about uh, guard spaces. Uh, well, you can just look at the examples and think of the guard spaces for, I think, space division multiplexing. It's quite obvious. <laughs> just place the base stations, whatever, 30, 40, 60 kilometers apart. Then you have space division. And that's what we do for analog radio. It's also quite obvious for um, frequency time division. Well, frequency, maybe it's a bit more complicated. For time division, the guard space, it's quite obvious. Just keep some microseconds of silence, so to speak, between the transmissions. For frequency, well, it's a problem. Just to give you the example. 
let's say these are the frequencies we use for a wireless LAN and then in the ideal world you say okay wireless LAN here's a channel and here's another channel and here's yet another channel so let's say channel 1 6 and 11 I will come back to wireless LAN and a chapter about uh, Wi-Fi technology Bluetooth etc for frequency division multiplexing, the problem is the real world because we don't have this nice spectrum use as shown here, but it's rather like this. So we have a so-called center frequency. That's always here, somewhere in the middle. And then we use the spectrum in a way that we have some overlaps. So guard space in FDM, that means, okay, keep the center frequencies uh, at a certain distance. So if the distance here is big enough, then it's okay. Then you have some overlapping of the channels, but that's okay. The problem, that's what we will see in wireless LAN is, and maybe you experience at home, we have many more channels in between, as you can imagine, two, three, four, five, etc. But those channels do overlap. So, for example, a channel like channel two would then look like this. And you have a lot of overlap with channel one. So there are systems like a wireless LAN where you use frequency division multiplexing to set up different channels for example at 2.4 gigahertz you have 13 channels in europe 11 in the us and i showed you this spectrum in the first chapter when you talked about frequencies but you have channels that overlap so what is the result interference so if your neighbor uses channel 2 and you use channel 1 you will have a lot of interference. If you both use the same channels, well, you have even more interference. Only if you use channel one and the neighbor uses channel six, you have almost no interference. So you can send at the same time and more or less the same space because the apartment does, apartments are close to each other. Uh, but if you look at your DSL router with the wireless LAN, you check for the channels, you will see that there are many, many, many neighboring wireless LANs with a lot of overlapping. And that's one of the reasons why the performance of wireless LANs can be quite poor because of this type of interference. So it de your, your performance depends on the performance of the neighboring wireless LANs. So if the, all the neighbors are streaming their whatever Netflix and Amazon Prime over the wireless LAN, you will have a problem with your video conference. So that's one of the reasons. So guard spaces are extremely important. Okay, for code uh, multiplexing, I will come back to the guard spaces. Um, polarization, that was one of these strange things. Do you know polarization from other areas have you ever heard of polarization ah exactly 3d in, in cinema chemistry filters yeah think of yogurt so there are these whatever things circular polarization clockwise and counterclockwise uh, exactly cinema uh, so that's roughly if you have uh your goggles well i'm not a painter sorry for that but then you have this type of polarization you don't see these fine lines but that's the basic idea you have two projectors for example for the right and the left eye and you have these polarization filters in front of the projectors and you get then the mixed signal to you to the uh, these polarization filters in front of your eyes and they separate again those two signals horizontal and vertical polarized light exactly so that is that is the idea of polarization okay then there's a question uh, if two wireless lands are exactly on the same frequency 
<laughs> okay, what do they use? Aloha, exactly. So we'll come back to these medium access schemes in the next chapter. Yeah. And indeed, just transmitting and hope for the best. Um, there's also a scenario in wireless lands where they do exactly this. So if there's the, the medium is idle for a long, long time, uh, the wireless LAN systems, they can just start sending. And if two LANs do this at the same time, same frequency, same space, we have a collision. Tough luck. So that's it. Yeah, we'll come back exactly to this Aloha. So Aloha, you know, from the uh, bachelor courses and computer networks, maybe uh, this is exactly this. Uh, one of the basic schemes we mix into then the medium access scheme of wireless LAN. Okay, so multiplexing, I think, is not too complicated. Just think of we can multiplex in different dimensions, code, frequency, polarization, time, space. And the interesting thing is maybe, um, you know, from fixed networks where we do this kind of multiplexing. Frequency. Time I already mentioned, that's normal for wire, for normal LANs, wired LANs. Are you aware of frequency multiplexing? Well, that's the most powerful scheme in fiber optics. So you use different wavelengths. Uh, different wavelengths, that's exactly what different frequencies mean. Well, normally humans speak about color of light we talk about frequencies, that's the same. Um, and we send 30, 40 different frequencies or wavelengths over the same fiber. And this is one way of reaching one terabit per second or more. So that's quite powerful scheme. We can even use polarization on fiber optics. Okay, are there some more questions about multiplexing? before we go to modulation. Okay, if this is not the case, we go to modulation. And modulation is maybe something strange for computer scientists, uh, because this really goes into electrical engineering. I try to keep it on a level that's understandable for uh, computer scientists. For you, it's important to understand, well, this is what you know, you cannot directly transmit the logical one and the logical zero. We know from our modulation scheme how we can actually code the ones and the zeros. So, for example, that's one way, the frequency shift keying, we can say a one is a high frequency and a zero is a low frequency. Okay, and uh, so we can do the same for the amplitude or the phase. So we can shift the phase, for example, by 90 degrees, by 180 degrees, as shown here. Um, so that's the idea. So we code the ones and zeros into these parameters of a sine wave. That's the basic idea. I gave some examples uh, how this is done in GSM. Um, then after that, uh, I directly showed, okay, a bit more advanced schemes. Uh, well, more advanced, that's the most simple one. Uh, So-called binary phase shift keying. And this exactly uh, how you show this in this so-called constellation diagram. So you coach one or several bits into one so-called symbol. So this is a symbol and a symbol, well, you can describe it by the amplitude, that's the length of the vector, that's basically the amplitude, and then you have the angle here, the phase shift. And phase shift, usually uh, you use it in a way that this is uh, the relative phase shift. So if you for example, first transmit 0, 0, then 1, 1. Then you have a phase shift here of pi or 180 
decrease because your sine wave jumps from here yip, up to here so that's 180 degrees or pi so that's the idea so by shifting the face and jumping uh, through this then you can code several bits in a symbol and the idea is not only to code them in the phase shift but also into the length of the vector so that means into the amplitude and this leads us then to this quadrature amplitude modulation so this is the combination you have different amplitudes and different phase shifts and this is one way of coding in this example four bits into uh, into one symbol and now the, you can continue this but i already uh, showed you well there are some limits and this is also one of the questions and the last example that was the digital television dvb t2 that's the current standard and this can go up to 256 quam so you have 256 points in this constellation diagram here shown is 64 but the problem is yes we could code more and more of these points in the constellation diagram so we cannot code here why because that's maybe too much power so there's a certain power limit so we cannot uh, put arbitrary amount of power into our signal so yes we can have more and more points in the constellation diagram but and this is exactly one of the questions so i will come back to this okay though that was the quick uh, wrap up um so uh first of all before i go to the question there was a good question from your side how could we send the same symbol twice the face would be the same both times we wouldn't notice the difference yes exactly so if we send the same symbol well twice three times four times we in the constellation diagram we stay at the same point but then you need additionally synchronization so well you know how long the duration of a symbol is and if there's no phase shift then you know ah a new symbol starts so uh, it's absolutely true. So you, if you stay at the uh, same symbol, well, you receive this in our simple example, the sine wave, but you will detect, aha, uh -huh, okay, we have that many symbols per second. And now we stay basically without a phase shift. And this means we have several times the same symbol. It's quite important that you do not go out of sync. So, and this is why we usually additionally uh, make sure that you do not send a long continuous streams of the same symbols. So there are means of, of scrambling so the, that you always have some phase shifts. Uh, but that is, uh, that is exactly a problem otherwise. Okay, so then there's an other question. Sure, I will go back and explain this. Let's go back. The question was this minimum shift keying. Okay, minimum shift keying. I just picked this as an example of uh, from our existing system, the GSM network, classical mobile phone system. And the idea is um, that you should, in this example, not look at the at the beginning just look at whatever arbitrary uh, point because sure you have to know okay when do we start so um, in this example this first setting of the even bits how should you know because this depends on history so um, so there's a convention how you start and what you do for the first uh, even bit so that's that's exactly a problem you have to start somehow so we do uh, we do not know from this simple example uh, this is why look at the example at some point uh, but not in the very beginning because then indeed why should we set uh, the even bit here 
to zero. So that's convention. Uh, so in the standard, it says, okay, somehow the signal starts and then usually you have certain so-called preambles, well-known preambles, so well-known bit patterns, and they're used first to synchronize. And after synchronization, then the whole game starts. That's the point. So there is a kind of standardized starting point. Otherwise, you're absolutely right. How should I know that I start with zero? Yeah. So uh, this is, you can not know. <laughs> so please start at, at some bit and ignore this, this very first uh, load. This is just somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So you're absolutely, absolutely right. So, and then, oh, that's also a very good um, example, uh, a very good question. Uh, is one symbol of a QAM always one sign period? Uh, no, <laughs> no. That's just, again, that's a problem of examples. Examples should be simple, but sometimes the simplicity is misleading. You're absolutely right. No. Um, think of frequencies, etc. we sometimes use. So this could be many, 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 many uh, periods. So depending on what signal you use. So uh, that just should give you an impression that, okay, there's a phase shift. But now depending on the symbol rate, um, and depending on the coding, this can be different. Once more, you have to look into the standard. So depending on if it's DVB or LTE or whatever, uh, then you have different, different shapes here. Okay. Um, during shift keying should we mix a uh, clock signal? I'm not absolutely sure what you mean by mixing. Here for, by the way, you see there we have now two periods for this, uh, for this one. Just another example, could be three or four. Um, could we mix a uh, clock signal? Oh, uh, you mean for synchronization? Yeah, so usually uh, these are self-clocking systems. So if you know the symbol rate, you know the, this all this coding, then you know by receiving this sine wave, you, you know you're synchronized. So just by receiving this, you're synchronized. And then there are many more ways for synchronization. So you have specialized bit patterns. So every, uh, let's say, whatever thousand bits, you have specialized patterns or each frame has a special training pattern. And those training patterns, they are well known. And this helps the receiver to resynchronize if you're out of sync. And then you receive the training pattern and then you I'm back in synchronization because otherwise you're lost. So the start of a frame, the end of the frame and all for all of this, we usually have specialized patterns. I will come back to this in chapter four when I talk about the classical GSM system, because uh, you can imagine that depending on the distance between you and the sender, there is a time difference. So the signal travels through space and then will reach you at some certain point in time. And if you're synchronized and then you're moving, well, you'll be out of sync sooner or later. So you have to resynchronize all the time because uh, if you're further away, it takes longer for the signal. If you're closer, it's shorter. So you have to synchronize all the time. So this is why you need this kind of synchronization. So in all, uh, usually, uh, let me think back in GSM, you have in each so-called time slot uh, synchronization. So all the channels are resynchronized every 4.1, whatever, 65 milliseconds, something like this, because then you will receive something and then you're synchronized again. Yeah. So that is indeed, that is indeed a problem. Well, solvable, as you know. Okay, another question. That's good. Ask. When using 256 QAM, there's a lot of overlapping. Um, how do we tell the difference? Is the amplitude? <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly the question. 
how do we tell the difference? But the difference, uh, the, the amplitude is very ba a bad way huh, because of interference. Okay, let's go back to this example. Very good question. So you're absolutely right. Oh, there's already this red arrow showing a certain angle or phase shift if you uh, see it in a kind of a relative way to other points in the constellation diagram. So you're absolutely right. If you have, for example, you want to receive this, well, you don't know it, but okay, that's the idea where the red point is right now. And then you add something, maybe there's a spike from some interference from an engine or something like this. It might be the case that suddenly you receive this. Absolutely right. So the problem is, if you have one point here, one, let's say, legal symbol, another legal symbol there, you will not receive exactly this one, but maybe some points close to this one, depending on the interference. And the idea now is, okay, you could say, okay, all the points I get that are on the left side of this kind of border, I will map to this symbol. So up to a certain amount of interference, you can handle this problem. But what happens if suddenly you receive, receive something up here on the other side of this border, the system will map this to another legal symbol. So interference, that means noise, adds something. Well, it might shift the face a bit. It might, uh, whatever, uh, contribute to the strength of the signal. So either it's stronger or weaker. But the result is you will not receive exactly this symbol in a perfect shape. But this is more a, a point cloud around this legal symbol. And as soon as you're too far away from a one legal symbol, the system will map you onto another legal symbol. So that's the case. So what is the result? This is a transmission error. So, um, for example, in DVB, you will directly notice this transmission error. So, for example, you see those pixelized blocks on the screen or part of the screen is freezing, things like this. So we'll directly notice this. For other systems, this will, there will be a failure of the checksum and you will simply reject the data and you have to perform a retransmission. Or for yet another system, maybe you can recalculate the original data because these are not the only bits you receive. You receive thousands of bits and then you apply, for example, forward error correction and then you can recalculate the original data. Or another example, and you can combine all this, is what's shown here, the so-called hierarchical modulation that you say, oh, the interference is really, really bad. So instead of receiving this nice point uh, here, I receive whatever uh, bizarre point cloud here. I cannot really say what the original symbol was, but at least I can say it's somewhere here. And that's the idea of coding the more important bits into this very simple upper right hand, lower right hand, upper left hand, lower left hand scheme. So we have a very simple QPSK scheme, quadrature phase shift keying, where we can code only two bits. And that's, that's the idea. So if the interference is too strong, we fall back automatically to a simpler modulation scheme. So for example, for picture information, the more important frames, if you think of MPEG coding, the more important frames we code in with the help of the QPSK. So these are the first two bits, but the more detailed information we code in the remaining four bits. So in, in case of very heavy interference, at least we see some frames, let's say every second, at least we see a bit of the movie but not the details, or you could code black and white and color in a different way. So that's exactly what happens uh, if we have too much interference. And that's also exactly what today's LTE does. 
So if your mobile phone detects too much interference, it can really in a very fast way change the modulation scheme. And this is one way of how we can handle this type of interference because we cannot always retransmit data that takes too long. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, so that is exactly, oh, that was already more or less the answer here to the third question. So how can we react to higher low interference? That's exactly the point uh, that we use different modulation schemes. So now we are from computer science. What does this mean if we switch modulation schemes when it comes to data rates? So what can you think of what happens with the data rates? Well, very simple, data rate is lower, exactly. So a classical QPSK has not the high data rate. That's, that's quite obvious because you have a certain symbol rate, maximum rate of symbols you transmit. And now it depends on how many bits you can encode. If you have a lot of interference, you cannot code that many bits into your symbol as you just saw from the example. If we have almost no interference, great. You can code more bits into a symbol. That's, that's the idea. Okay. So what else? So the first question was, uh, digital modulation. Why is the digital modulation not enough for radio transmission? A very general, very simple way. Don't think too complicated. So why do we need a bit more? Yeah, carrier, exactly, that's it. So these types of very simple questions are also the, the usual exam questions. So they say, okay, did you understand the basics? Uh, no one would ask you about 256 quam compared to whatever thing and symbol rates and things like this, but more the basic understanding. So yes, uh, that's exactly the problem. And the last uh, session we talked about antennas. Um, so modulation is exactly how we can shift the so-called baseband to a certain carrier frequency. And without this modulation, we cannot have, for example, frequency division multiplexing. Think of the classical analog radio stations. So we need this modulation to shift our, in this case, the audio signal, for example, to a certain carrier. And this is done with the help of the analog modulation. In our digital case, first we have to do this step from ones and zeros, our logical, our data, to some signals and then we can shift them up to uh, some carrier frequency. That's the idea here. The typical schemes, yes, we already went through this. Okay, and question two, yes, <laughs> I answered I answered this already when explaining the this question you had about interference. That's exactly the point that Usually, if you have these, let's say, legal symbols in space, uh, you can think of, well, these kinds of spaces around these points um, where I say, okay, if the points are somewhere in here, then I map it to this point. If the points are somewhere up here, I map it down to uh, this point. But this only works if the interference is not too bad. And that's exactly the point. If you want to code more bits here in your in constellation diagram, you see the legal points, they get closer and closer and closer to each other. And it's more and more difficult to decide, okay, now we have the border somewhere in between. But if there's just a bit of interference, the point cloud will just, uh, you know, have some points into the region of another legal point in the constellation diagram. So that is that is the problem. So you cannot code more and more. And this is why DVB T2 has this kind of adaptive scheme 
uh, there might be rain, snow and whatever between the sender and your receiver and that's one of the problems. Okay, so um, you shouldn't think too complicated about the modulation. As I mentioned, this is not electrical engineering, but you just should have a basic understanding of how we map the world we live in, that's the ones in the zeros, to the real world, because the real world does not understand these ones and zeros. Okay. Do you have some more questions about modulation? It's not the case. Okay. And uh, then in the final section, you can always come back with your questions, no problem. In this final section, something really strange, something strange, but this will pop up uh, quite often in the lecture when we talk about, for example, code multiplexing. So the idea here was we want somehow to mitigate the, all the problems we have from narrowband interference. So the idea is you usually, this is a simplified, idealized, etc. We all know it doesn't look like this, but you have a certain channel, it more looks maybe like this, um, and you can transmit your data there. This is the classical wireless LAN, for example, or, the cl or classical GSM network. So we have a narrow band. This is our band here. Here, simplified. This is just a rectangle. And we need a certain amount of energy. So that's the area here to transmit data. Now what we do is we spread we spread this and this section gives you some examples on how we do the spreading. So one way of spreading was the direct sequence spread spectrum and we can also do the so-called frequency hopping spread spectrum. The idea of DSSS is that we XOR all the data bits with the so-called chipping sequence. And if we use, for example, 20 chips per bit, that results in a spreading factor of 20. So we XOR each bit with these 20 chips. We can use the same chips for all the bits, or we can use a so-called chipping sequence. So the result is always the spreading. So just a brief uh, look at what we will do in the next chapter we will use special, maybe even secret chipping sequences. And without knowing this secret sequence, you cannot despread the signal. But these are different concepts you can combine here, spreading. And the idea of spreading is then we use either this chipping sequence or we go for frequency hopping. Frequency hopping, that means you actually jump through the spectrum and you more or less smear the energy over a larger spectrum. So you see here, this flat rectangle has more or less the same area. That means the same energy, but you distribute the energy over a larger spectrum. Okay, but in the end, we can transmit a user signal this way. So spreading factors in normal well, systems we use, commercial systems, we operate with factors of 10, 100, 200. That's quite normal. Military systems can operate uh, with factors of 10,000 or more. The reason is quite simple. If you really distribute your energy over a huge, huge spectrum, then the signal level will be lower than the so-called noise floor because you always have noise, background noise. That means by spreading the signal, you can even hide. You can hide your signal and no one will even recognize that you transmit something. So if you listen into the space, you only hear noise. 
you will not recognize that someone is transmitting a signal with the signal level lower than the noise level. So that's the trick usually for military systems. So you can hide. So yes, maybe you might think of uh, didn't we license spectrum to TV stations, whatever. Uh, yes, so there are systems, they're just in the background. They just use the spectrum, no matter if it's licensed or not, whatever. And for all the other systems like TV stations or whatever, uh, this appears as noise. And those systems simply have a huge spectrum, something like hundreds of gigahertz, but they're in the background. And as long as the signal power is not too high, this is just the normal background noise. Okay, now back to our commercial systems. So commercial systems that do frequency hopping spread spectrum is for example the classical Bluetooth. So Bluetooth jumps through the spectrum at 2.4 gigahertz and more or less smears the energy over a larger, a larger spectrum compared to a narrowband signal you might have for a classical wireless LAN. So there are also wireless LANs spreading the signal, but you see, you can use the technology in many different ways. So the idea is you spread the spectrum, DSSS or FHSS. Now, over the air, you will have kind of a superposition of the signals, your spread signal, the user signal. There's always broadband interference plus the narrowband interference. You want to avoid exactly this narrowband interference. That was one of the ideas of spreading the spectrum. So you will receive this and the receiver does the magical part. That's the despreading. Despreading you need the code for. We will not go into details how you do this with correlators, etc. But you can do this. In chapter three, I will give a brief example when we come to code division multiplexes. But the effect of despreading is that only your user signal will be despread. That's the idea. But you do not somehow despread the broadband interference or the narrowband interference. Narrowband interference you will even spread. Then you cut off at certain frequencies and you hope that there's enough energy up here in your user signal that you can reconstruct your original data. That's the key idea of this. Okay, so that is this uh, spreading and you had some examples, DSSS and FHSS, how this works. And then in addition, before we come to the questions, I also introduced uh, only on one slide. We could talk hours about this so-called software defined radios. We also had some practical assignments uh, with this in our labs uh, where you say, okay, why don't we do everything fully digital? That's the idea that you generate an extreme high data rate bit stream. And this bitstream contains everything like all this modulation, etc. And then you do the DA conversion, then some power amplifier and you send it over the air. And at the receiver side, the same, just the other way around. That's the theory. Real life, we have the problems. We cannot build these types of antennas, broadband, this type of broadband antennas, broadband amplifiers, etc. But these are real world problems. I mean, who cares about real world? Um, so, but that's the idea world. And if you're interested in this, just look up new radio, uh, USRP, universal software radio peripheral. And there are also some articles about this. Uh, we can do quite a lot. So with our SDRs, we can easily build something like wireless LANs, like GSM, like UMTS base stations. So there's software base station software. So you can actually uh, create a kind of fake base station. Uh, just be aware you're not allowed to send on these frequencies. So that's just for base basically learning, but please do not send. Okay, so that was a quick wrap up about this. What you should know is how can we handle narrowband interference? So we have, that's quite common. You have interference on a certain channel. 
think of now let's assume practical example you should give the answers we operate at 2.4 gigahertz and now you're here on channel 6 with your wireless LAN spamming whatever jamming uh, this channel and now someone else wants to operate another system what can you do to avoid this type of interference we have practical examples several answers are possible what could you do what is quite obvious what you could do use a different frequency absolutely right so you could operate your wireless LAN here perfect first answer move to another channel exactly now this number six is a mean guy it's jumping around it's narrow band but it's jumping so if you go to one maybe it's also jumping to one <laughs> what else could you do <laughs> build an even stronger antenna make it their problem yes <laughs> okay i've got the bigger antenna uh yes you're right <laughs> more sending power now let's assume you all have a maximum sending power 10 milliwatts uh, and the same type of antenna use multiple channels spreading exactly so you could be clever one way is uh spread your signal that's exactly what we just learned then no matter where this mean guy is jumping to you will always have enough energy here and there so that is no problem so that's one way uh, you can spread your signal and now the spreading basically can be done either using this chipping sequence yeah you can spread or and that's what bluetooth is doing bluetooth jumps 1600 times per second through 79 channels around this 2.4 gigahertz so you have many channels and you just for some microseconds here 625 microseconds here then you're here then here here so you jump through the spectrum and that actually smears your energy over the whole spectrum but you avoid the problems of narrowband interference okay so uh, that is the idea this is how you can mitigate this narrowband interference and the complexity well it depends um, so bluetooth is a simple scheme this hopping spreading despreading can be a bit more complicated so it it really depends so this frequency hopping you cannot really do for a larger spectrum because you have to build well the antennas that uh, can handle this the amplifier that can handle this but it's feasible around this for example 2.4 gigahertz that's no problem so spreading how this is uh, achieved just uh, look it up um main benefits okay um the guard spaces will come back we will come back to cdm you see some of the questions you will be able to answer when you know a bit more about the other technologies like cdm so the guard space in fdm are the frequencies that's quite obvious but in cdm hmm, what does it mean that codes are or the codes do have some guard space that's something i will explain in the next chapter for languages uh, uh it's simple to explain but this is just an example so languages is not really code multiplexing but you can imagine that the guard space between let's say um uh, well our german swiss german austrian german is not that big but between german and finnish is quite big so uh but we'll come back exactly to this so uh then uh, how to separate ah the question was dissimilarity of symbols yeah so what what do you mean by dissimilarity of the symbols so um yeah you always have to imagine that all your uh, symbols well these are parts of now let's assume a sine wave they all overlap they superimpose and you will get this kind of mixture so um okay okay 
uh, guard space, uh, the guard space, the symbols, uh, guard space by different symbols. Oh yes, you, you, you could do this. Uh, you could, could, for example, say, okay, uh, one is using this set of symbols, another sender is using a different set of symbols. And if you can separate this, you could do this. Yeah, right now I'm not aware really of a system doing this, uh, but why not? If you say, okay, one is using, let's say in our uh, 256 QAM example, only let's say the inner hundred whatever symbols and the other only the outer symbols. Yes, yeah, you could do this. So it's only a question how you separate, how you separate. And this is one way of separation. Yeah. Then we'll also come back uh, to direct sequence spread spectrum. That was our uh, multiplication X or your data with the chipping sequence. Um, you can even benefit from multipath propagation. So multipath propagation just that you can remember of this, this was that if you send out a signal, uh, parts of the signal go directly the line of sight, parts are reflected, scattered, diffraction, whatever they will be. And different parts of the symbol will reach you with different strength at different points in time. So what you can do with the DSS system is actually you have to recalculate this phase shift and then that means you can add those different paths the different parts of the signal to make it even stronger so this is what those systems usually do is with the help i think i explained this in the last q a that you have certain pilot signals where you know, okay, this should be the signal. I receive it via different paths. Then I know how much the phase shift is. Then I can actually reshift it back so that they are all kind of coherent, those signals. And then I can jointly despread these signals to get a stronger signal. So these are, if you look this up, those keywords or acronyms, direct sequence spread spectrum and multipath, you will find several solutions how you can benefit from this. So although multipath sounds bad in the first place, uh, we can actively, well, reconstruct the original strong signal by using the different paths. There are some more, uh, well, problems we have with multipath, but that has something, for example, to do if we use those signal for localization. That's what we do in several projects that we measure distances. And then if we have reflections, this fakes the distance. That's an effect, by the way, you recognize by the use of a GPS system downtown, you will not get the precise position due to reflection at buildings, etc. So that's a problem. Okay. So, as I said, not going too deep into electrical engineering, but if someone is interested in software defined radios, that's not even expensive. Uh, you can get these uh, SDRs, I think, starting at 50 euros something, and at 300 euros, that's a bit more expensive. Then you can do quite a lot. So, if someone is interested, please uh, come to us. We have such systems, and then you can play with this GNU radio and uh, actually create your own base station, things like this. Look into the spectrum, receive something, look how the spectrum really looks like. And uh, then this is something where you can really see how the constellation diagram looks in a wireless LAN system, for example, when you receive something. And if you do this QPSK, which should be these ideal four points, uh, then you see how those uh, point clouds are populated over time. And you will get something like this. It looks even wider and you wonder more and more why our wireless LAN works at all. But it's quite good to do forward error correction to find out the right points in the constellation. Okay, so if someone wants to play with SDR, there's a lot of literature. 
okay some more questions okay current understanding uh, in DSSS every bit in time gets split into several bits yeah of shorter lengths uh, but be aware we talk of chips then uh, because bits that's what we have our data bits and then we have several of these so-called chips okay could, uh, could you please explain again how more bits per second automatically corresponds to wider part of the spectrum um, well the I think the simplest way to understand is of for example, if you go to Shannon, the, in the Shannon formula, uh, you see the bits per second we can transmit. They are directly depend on the bandwidth that is available times and then we have signal to noise ratio. That means bits per second and the worst thing more or less to do is to send the sequence of one zero one zero one zero uh, depending on the coding so there's a lot going on and as i showed you this creates certain frequencies and shannon showed 100 no not almost 100 years ago that you need a certain bandwidth to transmit a certain number of bits per second so if we now transmit our chips which when we think digital is exactly these are also bits it's not our data bits but we code our data bits into chips if we increase our data rate so to speak not the user data rate so the chip rate this directly so if we replace bit bit is not a physical unit at all so if we now say chips per second if we transmit more and more chips per second we also have to increase the bandwidth or in other words if we do this if we create more chips per second and we code it for example using a PSK scheme ASK scheme FSK scheme we automatically create a signal with a higher bandwidth that means the more chips per second we have the more bandwidth we need to transmit. So basically this is a consequence, well, this is what nature does, but that's a consequence out of this Shannon's formula that if we want to have more and more chips per second, we need more bandwidth. So, and if we just do it, then this creates a signal that requires more of the spectrum. That's, that's the idea. Assuming same signal to noise, same coding. So that's that's the idea. So if we ex exactly use the same coding and we now have, let's say, 10 chips per second compared to one bit per second, we need 10 times more of the spectrum. That's that's the idea. OK, so this is a way of spreading. And if you use a million, um, then we spread by a million. So exactly the higher bandwidth just just happens <laughs> exactly that's nature yeah so because we have more signal changes per second just imagine a one zero pattern with a very simple um, keying scheme uh, this creates higher and higher frequencies so because we have to the nature not we but nature has to follow the signal somehow and as we learned from Fourier oh there now we are changing faster and faster more signal changes per second that requires higher frequencies that's all to be able to reconstruct this nature so uh, uh, the signal so nature does it best but requires 10 times more spectrum that means higher frequencies for coding your uh, original signal so it just indeed it just happens <laughs> so yes we can limit the bandwidth but then we lose part of the signal so that means spreading so spreading directly results in a wider band so more bandwidth requirement and shannon that's just the formula that more or less shows you ah okay B, this bandwidth must be higher if we want to transmit more of these chips, these potential signal changes per second. Yeah. 
Okay, so it just happens. Well, it's it's nature. <laughs> it directly it works. <laughs> So, and then there was a question, can't the resistance to tapping be easily broken by brute force, even with a military example, as long as we suspect there's a sender and have the hardware? Ah, and we know some sequence that will be sent. <laughs> yeah, so the point is spreading with a known sequence. Well, it works, it spreads your signal. So if you use a known chipping sequence, that's what wireless LANs, for example, do, uh, you use the so-called Barker sequence. Uh, these are 11 chips. Uh, everyone knows this. Then everyone can receive everything. The point is, if you start spreading with a secret code, so think of a pseudo-random number sequence. You have a seed value, then you create pseudo-random numbers, and then you perform the chipping, you spread your signal, let's say by a factor of thousand, by this secret random number sequence. Then the receiver has the problem without knowing the sequence, that means the initial seed, the random number, and where we are in the sequence, you have a problem. Because then you cannot despread. And how this despreading is done and the spreading, I will show you in chapter three with the help of a simple example. But for now, it's uh, en enough to know, okay, if we do not know this secret, this random uh, seed where we started the random number sequence, our chipping sequence, we cannot despread. And that's then the problem. Then even if you might recognize, oh, there is a signal, if you do not know these codes, the spreading codes, you do not know how to despread. So you can already hide your signal at the physical layer. So this is not encryption with a key like AES or DES or whatever system we use. On This is on layer two. When we talk about data, there we can use public key and private keys and symmetric, asymmetric cryptography. No, here we do it already on the physical layer. So we spread the signal with the help of a secret pseudo number sequence. That's the idea. So if you do not know this number, it's very, very difficult. So normal systems, you can easily listen to all these frequency hopping systems, all wireless LANs and all these systems. That is no problem. But this extreme uh, spreading, it's difficult. It's at least quite difficult. So yes, you could receive with the help of a software defined radio. That's why this is also of big interest for uh, the militaries. Um, you could receive everything and then you can apply all the algorithms to, well, hack into the sequence. But it's difficult. Feasible, I bet, for some of the systems. I'm not the expert here, but it's quite difficult. Yeah. So even if you know that there's signal, the point is you do not even recognize the signal because you hide the signal in the noise floor because the signal strength is quite low, lower than your noise. Uh, so that's one of the tricks. But sure, also there, there are possibilities to, to uh, tap, I guess, if you know the systems, you know the hardware, then you know the limitations of the hardware, then you can do something. And uh, the same is true for um, whatever, if you want to jam the systems. So there are military jammers, so there are some commercial jammers, don't use them, usage is illegal. But there are even military jammers, I remember there was one called Bumblebee, I think. Uh, and so these are broadband jammers and nothing works there anymore. So how, that's a good question, how do you uh, actually get the signal then from the background noise? The trick is, what you do is you basically apply the despreading to the noise. So the step of despreading, that's exactly shown here on this slide uh, 40, the step 3 to 4 is the despreading. 
And uh, the interesting effect is that um, you apply the spreading code to the signal. How? I will show you in the next chapter, so next Q&A session. <laughs> then I will give you a simple example, very, very simple spreading factor six. So very simple, how you do the uh, despreading, the spreading and the despreading. And if you apply the despreading, if you have some noise, etc., you can despread and uh, the result is then again a narrowband signal, but only the user signal that has been spread using this spreading sequence. And uh, that's the interesting characteristic. So there's a very good book of one of the inventors of all these CDMA and spreading technologies, Andrew Viterbi. Uh, this book is about this co-division multiplexing and co-division multiple access technologies. And there, over hundreds of pages, this is explained in some more detail. But then we would have to go really into the details of signal, signal transmission, etc., which is then out of the scope of this lecture. Because we uh, need some more time also to go up to the higher layer protocols, mobile, IP, and the behavior of TCP and all these things. And we have to cover all the mobile communication systems and wireless lines and LTE and whatever there is. But yes, this might be, maybe you're not that happy uh, with the explanation, but uh, if we dig deeper, then this requires some more understanding in transmission and transmission technologies. But the trick is indeed between step three and four, something magic happens. And this magic is exactly the despreading. So in chapter three, I will give you a simple example. Uh, let's say a computer scientist level example. <laughs> so I'm a computer scientist myself. So this no critics, uh, <laughs> nothing against computer scientists, but uh, we cannot really look into everything. Okay. So that, that is basically the trick. So chapter three, first section. Next session, I will explain this example in some more detail. Okay. Wow, oh, good question. So, but to establish the shared secret, we have to communicate without DSS and FHSS, right? Uh, so, the problem indeed is first we have to exchange secrets. Yeah, that's always a problem. Uh, so, but this can be done in many different ways. So, this has to be done on one of the, let's say, classical ways that you transmit a secret either in a kind of a personal way or that you use with the use of certificates, etc. So that is really something you have to do before. So you need some secrets. So that's quite similar to what we do in our computers today. We have some certificates, we trust the certificates, we might have a trust uh, hierarchy and so that's the same for all military use or civil use of these systems. So there must be some trust. Yeah, without trust. Yeah, we, we could have uh, <laughs> public or whatever key signing parties. <laughs> Can't imagine how the militaries do this, but uh, you could do these things. Yeah. So um, there are even systems that you can, when you, for example, fire a rocket that you then uh, program a shared secret into the rocket and then you can remote control it and all these things. But for ours, we would use simple certificates. So um, that's something. So the problem indeed is if you do not have a secret before you use this, this is always a problem, there is no real secure way of exchanging something. Yeah. So if you do not trust the other, if you do not even know who the other guy is, so you, you need some trust anchor somewhere. So, um, so this is why maybe the devices, by setting up the devices before you use them, you pre-install something and you hope you will never get out this secret. So there are uh, certain modules for this. Also for our normal PCs, you have this uh, for uh, these trusted environments, you have certain parts of hardware in our devices. So that's how you could start this part of trust. And then uh, you could start even using this now for our spreading.
Yeah, but that's that's a problem. So if you do not have this kind of trust anchor, you have a problem. But that's uh, then again, if you're interested in this, then my colleagues will talk a lot more about uh, security mechanisms and how you can implement this. Yeah. Okay, some more questions. So if there are no more questions, you can always also send an email. I will thank you all for this Q&A session. Please do write me uh, an email if you have some more questions. Okay, so then please do have a look into the material I provided and the next time then some more about the secret of CDMA. And just send me your questions and I can also answer the questions the next time. Okay, thanks a lot and have a nice time. Stay healthy.